So the topic for today is one of those great existential questions. <coughs> what are we doing here? Also often termed or expressed in the question, so what is the meaning of life? Why, why are we here? Now I'm going to preface my remarks with a statement that you will not hear in very many pulpits. <laughs> I don't like to call this a pulpit, but I'm talking about the others. <laughs> but you won't hear this just about anywhere else. So what I'm going to say is do not believe a single thing I say. <laughs> In your, and don't confuse what's, what's in your mind with what's in your heart. What's in your mind is what other people have told you. <coughs> what's in your heart is your connection to God. So, listen to what I say and believe what resonates with what's in your heart. You are responsible for deciding what's true. Truth is particular to you. There is no such thing as objective reality. No such thing as objective reality. For the simple reason, for the simple reason that everything is as it appears, and appearances are based on perceptions, And perceptions are based on perspectives. And there is nothing more subjective than your perspective. So consequently, there is no objective reality. There is only your reality. What resonates with you, what is true for you. So a word about why you might be interested in listening to me. <laughs> or not. It's okay. I have a very thick skin. I've spent years, literally years, thinking, meditating, praying, listening, reading literally hundreds of books in this process of coming to my own conclusions about what are we doing here? I spent 30 years as a card-carrying atheist whose hero was Madeline Murray O'Hare. I knew by the time I was 16 that I was being conned and that what had been described as God simply couldn't be the case. So I said, who needs that? <coughs> and I had a couple of experiences that were outside the realm of what one would consider objective reality, and I had to call into question everything that I thought. And so that began this process that I've spent years in acquiring an understanding of the way things seem to be working. And I share it only because you might find it interesting and you're free to reject it. Be clear about that. Just because I'm standing up here does not mean that I know the answers. It absolutely does not mean that. Not only do I not know the answers, sometimes I don't even know the questions. <laughs> Having said all of that, why are we here? What are we up to? What 
is going on? It's pretty clear to me that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. <coughs> Life is eternal. There is no such thing as death. What we view as death is simply the changing of a phase, simply the passing of one phase into another. It is no different than taking off one suit of clothes and putting on a different suit of clothes. We have an earth suit. It's called a body. We use it until it wears out, and then we lay it aside and we go on with eternal life. That's what we're up to. And the question is, why are we here on this planet? Why are we doing the things that we're doing? Why are we observing what seems to be strife and upset and turmoil and lack and frankly what looks to be evil going on in the world? Why are we doing that? And I think the answer, the answer that I've come to that makes the most sense is that we are here in order that the divine might have the infinite experience of itself. Each of us is an expression of divinity, and the divine can't have the experience of all that it is without creating experiences. We exist in a world of duality, and yet we're told that unity is the true state of the universe that we are all one. How can that be? What is the purpose of living in a world of duality if unity is where we're headed and what we're up to? And I say the purpose is simply this. The purpose is that we are into having an experience. You can't have an experience in your mind that's very rich. For instance, you might be the world's greatest cook, the greatest expert on creating ice cream. You might know all there is to know about texture and ingredients and freezing points and all of the things that go into making ice cream. You might be the world's expert on chocolate ice cream. But until you have the experience of a spoonful or more <laughs> of chocolate ice cream in your mouth, you haven't had the experience. And experience comes, the richness of experience comes from contrasts. And contrasts is the very essence of duality. So if we are to have rich experiences, we must have something to contrast it with. We cannot know hot unless we know cold. We cannot know good unless we know evil. We cannot know joy unless we know sadness. So this world of duality that we find ourselves in is created for the very purpose of having rich experiences and rich experiences of our own divinity. So the soul is seeking to experience in reality what it already knows. The soul knows its own perfection. The consciousness doesn't because we have to take on a little bit of amnesia in order to exist in a world of duality. If we didn't take on this amnesia, we couldn't experience what we aren't. In order to experience what we are, we have to have the experience of what we aren't. So, 
we set about to enter into this world of duality for the express purpose of experiencing ourselves as the divine energy that we are. We have to experience all of the attributes of the divine. Experience ourselves as compassionate, as loving, as generous, as kind, as forgiving. And until we have something to compare that to, we can't have the real experience of discovering our own divinity. So this thing that we're up to here isn't chaos. It isn't random. It is ordered. And you don't have to believe a word that I'm saying. Remember that. It's my experience that we are plan, planning our incarnation before we come here. We know what we're going to be up to. We know the major experiences that we will choose to have. Souls move together in groups. And they have relationships that transcend one particular life. So when we gather prior to an incarnation, we plan what's up. We actually sit down with other souls, with angels and advisors, and we create a curriculum. We actually do that. And we're always at choice. Whatever we've created for ourselves can unfold in the way we planned it or not. We're always at choice. We always are free to say, ah, I'm done with this. Goodbye, I'm not going to go there anymore. But we are in the process of becoming fully aware of our divinity. That's what we're up to. So, there are no victims. There are no villains. Because it is a plan. It is a script. You've heard the, the mystics say, it's an illusory world. And yes, it is an illusory world. It isn't the real world. It is the world of duality where we can have an experience that gives us a contrast, that gives us a real understanding of who we really are. So that's what we're up to. And when you get to the point where you understand that it's all unfolding just as it should, even what looks like a tragedy, even what looks like something is wrong. When you understand that we have created this as a joint venture. It is as if we sat down, all of us together, and created a movie script. And we said, oh, I'll play this role, and, I'll, and another will play that role, and we'll decide. And, and all of this orchestration goes on. And the result is we get to realize who we really are. And that is the purpose of this whole adventure. It's not random. It is not chaotic. It is in divine order. And all of it leads us to what the Course in Miracles says is our only function. Forgiveness is our only function. There's a wonderful story that Neil Walsh <coughs> tells. It's called The Little Soul in the Sun. And it speaks directly to this process. So the story goes like this. The little soul is in heaven with all the other souls angels 
and having a conversation. And God is listening in. And the little soul says, oh, I want to experience myself as a forgiving soul. And God says to the little soul, little soul, look around you at these magnificent souls that you're surrounded by. How in the world could you ever need to forgive anyone for anything? And the little soul looked, and he said, Oh my goodness, these are incredibly beautiful, loving souls. I couldn't dream of needing to forgive them. I wonder what that's about. And another soul walks over and says, Oh, hey soul. I could probably figure out in our next incarnation something that would make you think you needed to forgive me. <laughs> I could do that. And I would do it because I love you and you want to experience yourself as forgiving. I could do that for you. But remember, when we're in the middle of this thing that we're going to do, don't forget that I've done it for you, so that you can experience yourself as forgiven. Remember that I am doing what needs to be forgiven for the very purpose of you getting to experience yourself <coughs> as forgiven. And that's what, that's what we're up to. When somebody cuts you off, forgive them. When somebody leaves your life and says, I'm done with you, forgive them. Because each and every event in your life is orchestrated for the very purpose of contrast, for the very purpose of you rediscovering who you are. So absolutely, completely, forgiveness is your only function. Because everything that comes down the pipe, that comes your way, is an opportunity for you to grow. Life is about growth. There was a great sage who was on the planet, actually lived here in Ann Arbor for a while. His name was Glenn Bo Schembechler. <laughs> and he said, you either change for the better or you get worse. <laughs> he was talking about a football team, but it actually applies to life. Change is inevitable. Take charge of the change in your life. Be who you would choose to be tomorrow. Be the grandest version of yourself the world has ever seen. And because we're all actors on stage, reading the lines that we wrote, literally, forgiveness is always appropriate. <coughs> so thanks for listening, and you don't have to believe a word I said.